We are just trying to share my screen here. Share your screen, Bitte. Somehow I'm unable to share the screen. You you have that green button, share screen. Yeah, yeah, that's At active. Yeah, yeah. Click that. Yeah, yeah, it's working. Yeah, yeah. We also have Hi, Dr. Hema Devakar, who's just joined in. Dr. Asta, we can see your slides. Yeah. Please, you can okay. move. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Astha Chavla Trehan, and I'll be discussing about the dermatological manifestations of diabetes mellitus. Now, can integument actually be a curtain raiser for diabetes? Is it actually a myth, or are we just megalomaniacs thinking that it can be a curtain raiser? Let's find out. So, the manifestation of skin um, findings in diabetics in different studies has found out to be 30 to 70 percent. And the prevalence is similar in type 1 and type 2 diabetics. Although the cutaneous infections are more common in type 2, autoimmune-related lesions have been seen more commonly in type 1 diabetics. And a good metabolic control not only prevents them, but also helps to cure some of these manifestations. Now, these skin findings can actually be classified into four major classifications. The first one being cutaneous manifestations of diabetes. Second one being cutaneous concurrences of diabetes. Third, diabetes associated with dermatological pathologies and diabetic therapy causing cutaneous complications. Now let's start the discussion about the cutaneous manifestations. The first one, which is acanthosis nigricans. Now I'm sure everyone here would have come across acanthosis nigricans in their clinical practice. It basically presents as a velvety hyperpigmented patch to plaque-like lesion which is present on the nape of the neck and the folds like axilla. One point that I would like to make here is for the physicians, once they notice that a patient presents with acanthosis nigricans to also please notice for similar changes on the face because facial acanthosis nigricans has been an identity which has been well proven and does not respond to standard depigmenting treatment. A good metabolic control with lifestyle modification a few keratolytics and depigmenting agents is the prime treatment for this condition. Acquired perforating collagenosis. Now, these are basically perifollicular, if you notice my cursor, these are perifollicular reddish papulonodular lesion which have a central keratin plug. These are commonly noted in elderly diabetics who also have an underlying diabetic nephropathy or are undergoing treatment for renal failure. Treatment here would be treatment of the underlying renal failure and for the cutaneous manifestations, we can give topical retinoids and topical corticosteroids. Diabetic bullet. Now, these are basically sterile, non-inflammatory bullet which present on the normal surrounding skin and the contents are absolutely sterile. Drainage under aseptic conditions with topical antibiotics would suffice for the treatment of these bullet. Diabetic dermopathy, a special point of note here that these are one of the most common manifestations that we come across in diabetic patients and these are usually absolutely benign and harmless. These are also called as shin spots or the pigmented pre-tibial patches. Very rarely can they be infected secondarily by bacterial infection which then requires treatment. Diabetic foot. Now, I'm sure everyone would have come across this as well in their practice. Now, this usually starts as a callus on the pressure point of the feet and progresses to form an ulcer with the underlying pathophysiology being a diabetic neuropathy resulting from a microangiopathy. A wound debridement along with pressure relieving prosthesis would be an ideal treatment. However, prevention of diabetic foot would include a regular diabetic foot checkup with foot Doppler and treatment of any minor callus that the patient might present with. Eruptive xanthomas, these are reddish to yellowish, tender and pruritic. So they are not asymptomatic. These are tender and pruritic papillonodular lesion, which usually presents over the extensor surfaces and Treatment of these not only require a good metabolic control in terms of a controlled sugar level, but also needs treatment for hypertriglyceridemia. Necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum, also called as NLD. Now, they typically present as bilateral symmetrical yellowish to brown plaques, although it appears red here because the patient is of a Caucasian 
uh, skin type. So they usually present as bilateral pigmented plaques and they tend to crust usually on the pretibial areas and can also ulcerate and be secondarily infected. Scleroderma, uh, scleroderma diabeticorum or also called as diabetic scleroderma. This usually presents as a symmetrical diffuse, however, asymptomatic non-pitting edema most commonly presenting over the neck, the shoulder and the interscapular region. It can also present over the hands where it can lead to restriction of mobility. Most of the cases have been reported post a streptolytic infection and usually it is self-resolving and in addition, a good sugar control also helps in an earlier resolvement of this condition. Now, these were the cutaneous manifestations. Let's jump on to the cutaneous concurrences. The first one being acrocodons or skin tags. Now, these are basically benign cutaneous overgrowths. One important point to note is they usually present over a background of acanthosis nigricans. If they are presenting without, then you should also think about veruca vulgaris or also called as the common warts as one of the differentials. These by themselves are absolutely benign and do not warrant treatment until unless patient feels cosmetically disfigured from them. Finger pebbles. This is basically diabetic thickening which occurs over the skin, over the dorsa of the hand, predominantly affecting the periungual and the area over the knuckles, also called as the Huntley's papules. Pigmented purpuric dermatosis. Now, these very importantly need to be differentiated from vasculitic lesions. Most of the vasculitic lesions would be blanchable. However, these pigmented purpuric dermatoses, these are non-blanchable lesions which arise because of the capillary fragility leading to an RBC extravasation and formation of siderophages. Periungual telangiectasias. This presents as a reddish discoloration around the proximal nail folds Usually, it is absolutely asymptomatic and does not require treatment. However, if it is associated with any ragging of the cuticles or tender fingertips, it does warrant treatment. Rubiosis fasciae, although extremely rare in the Indian skin type, it is very common in fair skin types like type 1 and type 2, where it can be present in as much as 60% of the population and could be a chronic feature, a chronic cutaneous feature of diabetes. One of the important messages that the patient needs to be conveyed here is to restrict the caffeine and alcohol intake to minimize this vasodilatation. Now, the last of cutaneous concurrences is infections, which can be broadly classified into viral, fungal, and bacterial. Viral infections, I'm sure everyone is well aware of, the most important being a herpes zoster disseminated infection or a fulminant herpes zoster. Now, one important point to note here is, as per our traditional learnings, herpes zoster is something which has always been unilateral and dermatomal, dermatomal. However, in patients with diabetes, it can also be bilateral and it can also be multidermatomal involving as many as 20 dermatomes. So, a patient who presents to you with a fulminant zoster not following the con conventional rules of or zoster distribution, please rule out an underlying diabetes and also make sure that the metabolic control is well within limits. Another viral infection could be a recurrent herpes simplex infection, which might present as a herpes simplex labialis or a genital herpes simplex. Coming to fungal infections, candida is the most common fungal infection which has been documented in patients with diabetes, which can present either in the form of a candidial belenoposthitis or a candidial vulvovaginitis. Besides this, other candidial infections like web intertrigo are also not uncommon. Another infection which is very common in diabetics is dermatophyte infections, also commonly called as tenia. I'm sure you would have seen such patients in your OPDs. Now, one point here to uh, make note of is that please do not prescribe these patients with topical steroids because not only that makes the fungal infection extremely resistant, but also changes the morphology, which makes it extremely resistant to the traditional as well as the higher treatments. Bacterial infections with pseudomonas, with coronary bacterium and with MRSA streptococcal are extremely common in diabetics and a good sugar control is something which can help us eliminate these. 
Now coming to diabetes mellitus associated with dermatological diseases. Now all these diseases have been linked to diabetes by the virtue of sharing a common autoimmune pathway. The first one being granuloma annular, which basically presents as skin colored, absolutely asymptomatic lesion with a central clearing and a raised border, which is papillonodular. Although in a non-diabetic, these would be localized. However, a diabetic individual usually presents with a disseminated granuloma annular. Psoriasis vulgaris. This is a papillosquamous lesion, which is usually covered by silvery micaceous scales and is commonly present over the extensors, typically showing a predilection for worsening in the winter weather. Lichen planus. Now, these are usually pigmented, plain topped pruritic lesions, which not only present in the skin, on the skin, sorry, but also in the oral cavity, in the scalp, as well as the nails. In fact, there's an entity wherein there's a triad of lichen planus with diabetes and hypertension, which is called as the Grinspan syndrome. The psoriasis vulgaris and lichen planus patients, both of them, they show something which is called as the Kibner's phenomena, which is basically the spread of the lesions on the lines of trauma. So in case you come across these patients, a general advice should be to not scratch or rub on any of these lesions. The last of the... Uh, of this classification is vitiligo, which basically presents as completely depigmented irregular macules over the extensors and not just depigmentation of the skin. They can also present with depigmentation of the hair, which is called as leukotritia and is associated with a worse prognosis. The last classification among the skin manifestations is the diabetic therapy causing cutaneous complications, which could arise because of the oral hypoglycemics or because of the insulin therapy. Now, oral hypoglycemics could by themselves cause generalized pruritus, urticaria, non-blanchable erythema, erythema minor, lichenoid drug rash, and chlorpropamide and tolbutamide have been specifically linked to phototoxic reactions. Insulin, on the other hand, could cause lipoatrophy, which could present like this, wherein there are localized areas of fat loss because of repetitive insulin injection over these sites, one of the ways we could mitigate this is by doing a rotational insulin therapy and switching to non-lipolytic preparations of insulin. The reverse of this is lipohypertrophy, which could also be because of insulin injections, wherein you can see soft dermal, characteristically described as underfinger slippable uh, lipomoid lesions, which arise because of repetitive injections at same sites or because of a higher dose, switching to more cutaneous friendly and a rotational insulin treatment is something that might help us prevent this. Insulin allergy has been reported to bovine as well as the porcine forms of insulin and using human preparations is something which will help us prevent insulin allergies. Now, uh, this is Mehta Chavla's criteria, which I had the privilege to formulate with my respective HOD with my, uh, during my uh, residency years. So we have uh, broadly classified them into predictive indicators and affirmative indicators. Predictive indicators include candidial belenoposthitis, diffuse alopecia, which is hair loss, extensive dermatophytosis or tinea infections, fulminant herpes zoster, and recurrent bacterial infections. Affirmative indicators include acanthosis nigricans, acquired perforating dermatosis, diabetic dermopathy, diabetic foot, and scleroderma. This was a review study we had done in 2016 on diabetes and belenoposthitis. This review basically sensitizes the diabetic care providers to take a history and perform a basic physical exam in any person presents with penile symptoms and also encourages the dermatology care providers to screen for diabetes in such persons. Similarly, we also did a review on herpes zoster and diabetes, and it actually makes a really strong case for screening all the diabetes for uh, screening all herpes zoster patients for diabetes and making sure that they have an optimum glycemic control. So the key points for takeaway would be diabetic dermopathy, shin spots is an absolutely benign and one of the most common skin conditions that we see in patients who have a long-standing diabetes. The predictive indicators are as follows and these are the affirmative indicators. Thank you.